And he started lambasting us with all the things that we we're doing wrong. And I'm thinking to myself, I need to pull a fire alarm or something and end, end this meeting because it's going to really demoralize you know, the employees. It's going to demoralize me. And, and then I, I, I dug in deep and realized that this was gold. Thank you so much for tuning into Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans. And guys, we have a very special guest on today. You know how everybody wants to scale their business to a unicorn version, right? Billion dollar valuation. Well, what if I told you our next guest has seven unicorns underneath his belt and he's working on his eighth and he's also directly involved in founding 11 companies? Well, Guess what? That's the reason why I have this next guest on. Just to share with you a little bit about his background, he's directly involved in raising over $700 million of private company early stage financing, $1.4 billion of public equity offering, and $2.4 billion of M&A transactions. He is currently the co-founder, president, and board member of the Thrive Bioscience. Thrive Bioscience actually focuses on manufacturers and sells to researchers a family of instruments with extensive software tools that provide previously unavailable live cell imaging, analytics, and automation for free reproducible cell culture imaging for improved processes and breakthrough insights. If you have no idea what I said, well, that's the reason why you got to listen to this episode because we're going to be talking about a lot of things, his current project, but also the other projects he's worked on. He's also previous executive director of Trust for Science and Technology, president and COO of Endevis Pharmaceuticals, which he had an incredible exit, EVP and CFO of Interneuron Pharmaceuticals, which he also had an exit, CFO and VP of Corporate Development and Strategic Planning at Crytek Corporation, acquired, also an exit. And please welcome my next guest, which I'm very humble to have him on, CEO and President Board Member of Thrive Biosense, Bioscience, excuse me, the one and only Thomas, Thomas Forrest Farb Horch. How are you doing today, Thomas? Good. Thank you for having me, Christian. Well, man, Appreciate I'm excited it. about having you on because we're going to be diving into your ability to scale unicorns. And you obviously are working on this next one here, which is Thrive Bioscience. But one of the things that I saw, which is the underlining common denominator in all your companies and all the projects, you focus heavily on the healthcare, science, and technology world. And Thomas, I want to start with where did that passion come from? Was that younger uh, story or was that just something you've always gravitated toward? Because you're a Harvard graduate uh, university and Bachelor of Arts. So I'd love to get uh, where, where, that, where that passion came from in, in regards to healthcare and science and technology. It, it's great to do these, these kinds of um, interviews because it does make me think about things that I don't normally think about, like, you know, why the heck did I um, – do this and what drives uh, and what drives me, and uh, I think a lot of it has to do with personality, uh, a an inquisitiveness, a uh, ability to not accept that things have to be the way they are. Um, coming out of the '60s and early '70s, it was really a, a period of a lot of change. Things were questioned. I actually think that that really rubbed off on me to not accept this is the way it's always been done um, or we can't change that or we can't do this better. Those ignite a, a passion to understand how to, make it, how to make it better. So I think a lot of it came out from personality and a lot of it came from studying a lot of different things, very broad. I, I um, have a liberal arts background, um, but I spent a lot of time doing things like programming. But being able to meld fields, look at things in different ways. Also, I traveled a lot. My father was an anthropologist, so I lived many, many places. And it teaches you the value of, of having international travel and contact is it teaches you that there is more than one way to do the exact same thing and that you can look at the same situation from two completely different vantage points. And that's what a lot of entrepreneurship is about and finding you know, new ways to do things. 
what helps you? Because I would imagine you've taken that skill and acquired to all your different companies you have founded. How has that helped you in regards to being able to take a situation and look at it, separate yourself emotionally from it, and look at it and how to attack it, and then also not only how to attack the problem or the whatever the situation is, but find the most effective solution for whatever that hurdle is? So I think we are um, affected a lot by our, our childhood, and my father was a, a writer and researched you know, many, many books and looked to many sources of information. And so I, when I see a problem and I am triggered by this, oh, we can't make this better, how I attack it is to, um, to research it, to kind of I, uh, liken it to stumbling around in the woods, which is walking around within the, the idea, within the community. So maybe you read some books, you go to conferences, go to read magazines, you look at how other, I always look at how other countries do it. We should never be anything, I think, but humble. If we start thinking that we do it the best, um, that's the beginning of a downfall of an empire or, or an, an industry. So I attack it broadly and I bring multiple fields to it. So um, as you mentioned, I've been in, in tech as well as life sciences. And within life sciences, there are many different silos. Pharmaceuticals, devices, diagnostics, those are our worlds. They don't really know much about each other. Um, but I like to attack things from multiple disciplines. So as you described in my career, I was in pharmaceutical companies. I was Cytic as a diagnostic company. Um, I, three of the companies I started were artificial intelligence companies. Um, so I think um, having that broad perspective is incredibly valuable and not looking at things the same way as everyone else. Well, you know, and it's it's interesting because the compound effect as well. Once you you know exit a you know one billion dollar company, then it's like you know obviously the the expedited process is obviously you know the probability of you exiting again and again and again is much higher because again it's that compounding effect in the right way, and you're bringing a lot of different skills to that next venture. Um, well, I want to talk into you know uh, the bioscience as well as the the. the the thing you look at in regards to building a company, all right, from from idea to billion dollars, there's a lot of you know time horizon, a lot of things that are going on in that. Um, I know this is kind of a big question, but I want to take it kind of thirty thousand foot view and then bring it down. If you could, Thomas, you look at it, the life life cycle of a business, going from idea to inception to this, this billion dollar valuated company exit. What are some of those things that you, now that you've done this numerous times, seven, working on your eighth now, what do you see is kind of the common patterns in regards to, okay, hey, you know what, this is the idea, we got to raise capital, boom, now phase two, phase three, phase four, et cetera. What are you noticing in regards to the, those, those consistent patterns, regardless of the industry? Um, so I think the commonality of, of starting these companies, and especially the, the unicorns, um, we kind of started talking about how you attack it and get and get the idea, uh, which is from inquisitiveness and you know looking at it from multiple uh, multiple points of view. But then you got to do something with the idea, um, and where I start is literally just an idea. Um, the seventeen companies before Thrive that I started. Almost all I started with, so I heard an interesting idea and tried to figure out really, you know, kind of what the business plan is. So the commonalities among them is personality and um, what you have to try and be. So it takes incredible perseverance and there are always going to be problems. Every one of my unicorns faced death two, three times. And so being able to make a comeback um, is, is incredibly important. To be able to solve problems is incredibly important. And that's when that you know, kind of broad perspective and also a personality where you have to have some ego 
you have to have some optimism to do this. But if you're not open to ideas and you don't seek help um, when you need it, you're, pr you're very likely to fail more often. So a commonality is learn as much as you can, particularly customers are incredibly important. Um, having a team is in incredibly important and that is always you know, an, incredible, an incredible challenge. Um, and raising money is, but you know, those things with perseverance, um, you know, you can make, you can make them happen. And the way I find perseverance, I think commonality across all of them, uh, well, not the, the first, um, my first unicorn made rich people richer. Um, I started a company which to this day monitors 90% of all credit cards and debit cards for fraud and now uh, generates FICO score algorithms. Um, and that made banks richer. And I wanted something, if you're gonna work incredibly hard, which every startup takes just immense, I wanted to change the world. I wanted, when I'm, when I'm sitting in an airport and every airplane out has been canceled and I'm gonna have to sleep on, on chairs with armrests, something has to keep me going and what generally does is a bigger vision and a bigger vision of changing of changing the world and that vision is what allows you to recruit great people uh, to get customers to raise money they can feel it um, and they can feel that you're going in a direction and an inspiring one so um, after the first unicorn the next the next six all set out to change the world and did. So it was that passion and it was that drive and that vision. And we're gonna be talking about that, how you integrate that into your culture because that's something that you, uh, that's uh, I think what we talked offline is your superpower, uh, which is really cool. I wanna talk about and loop around, you mentioned almost each one of the unicorns almost were very close to death, right? And I'm curious, looking back in those death situations, like quote unquote, then was there a pattern? Was that internal? Uh, like wrong decision making or wrong step that you took and you learned from that uh, that that caused the death or was that causation or was it an external event that's something you couldn't control that almost brought death to the company what was that when you're looking at those consistent patterns in almost the death situations well that's a great question one I haven't um, haven't thought too much about but is really worth um, worth categorizing so you know Number one, I want to say that experience just takes you so far, and we all are capable of making new mistakes. Um, we have an you know incredible ability to do that. Although how you react to them is often very experience based, um, and having you know having been through it before, so it the the death situations. Um, have generally always been external, but it's not a good idea to externalize. Um, in other words, how you know how we responded you know, to it. Things such as in life sciences, a regulatory action that's not positive, so you don't get clearance or you know or or approval. I mean, those are kind of you know binary type um, type decisions. Um, but you can always go back. Um, you can do it better. Customers not not buying your product or not liking it um, external yes but you know it was our fault for not really listening to to the market and one of my absolute favorite uh, business writers authors is Steve Blank and I think every entrepreneur should be really familiar with with what he's written and he's known for what's called lean entrepreneurship which is different than the way things used to be done. So rather than building a, a product and having it perfected and worrying about, well, you don't want to put it in front of the customer until it's perfect, you actually do the opposite. You bring the customer in at a very early stage. You try to have a minimum viable product. Uh, you introduce that concept, MVP, and you show it. You, know, you show it to the customer. And so... Um, 
listening to customers is just incredibly important. My co-founder at Thrive came in one day with a quote that is now kind of our mantra. And it's from C Blank. And he said, there are no answers in the building, so get out and talk to customers. We can, we can hypothesize, we can spend money on market research, um, but having direct contact with users is you know, just absolutely invaluable. So you, know, you have to, you can't externalize it. Um, if, if customers aren't accepting it, you, know, you have to find out why, you have to listen. Um, there's something called pivoting in kind of the entrepreneurial word it means different things to different people, but it's change, it's learning, it's adapting, um, which is tricky because being an entrepreneur, you're not going to meet with easy success in most things, so you're determined to keep moving forward, yet at the same time, you have to listen to, am I really right in this you know, persistence and um, hard work, or should I, should I pivot? That's probably one of the most difficult things. Um, yeah, things are difficult. Should you give up, or is it, is it just temporary? Um, and I'm going to still believe in my, in my vision. That's a hard. Balance. Well, see, this is what I find so interesting. It's like an art and science, and I want to, I want to talk a little bit about this because this is where the entrepreneur has to kind of really establish. The founder has to come with experience and looking at these projects. We have, we have seen numerous times where, you know, being, um, you know. Stubborn for an idea is good to some extent, but sometimes you have to be flexible with exactly. the path as well, and maybe you know uh, be be very um, focused on on the va the vision, like you mentioned as well. The reason why I'm saying this is because I'm curious, Thomas. There, there's probably been situations where definitely when you're you know running. 80, 90, 100 million dollar top line, whatever it is, and you're really scaling, things are rock and rolling, and you take some of the money and you push it toward a, a project thinking that's exactly what these customers want, that's exactly what this is going, and then all of a sudden you push out the product, minimal vial project in that next level, and they don't start purchasing it. So then you just wasted, right, quote unquote, wasted almost 50, 60 million dollars, whatever the project was, maybe 20 million, doesn't really matter, right, money's money. And then you sit there and say, well, do we keep going down this path or do we have to the opportunity cost of, hey, I'm going to cut it off, stop and pivot. And so that's where I'm curious because that's a feedback loop in regards to it's very contextual. It's really you have to understand what, what the story is telling you. So, Thomas, mm -hmm. when you're looking at those situations, since you see the value, the vision, you're bringing everything together and say, OK, hey, this project, maybe if we have another three months of runway – Maybe we can get it off the ground, and maybe there's some, you know, probability of succeeding. But also, there's got to be a point where you, as a CEO, you have to cut it off and say, "Well, we're not seeing any progress, we're not seeing any success, and it's hard." And you got to cut it off and then pivot and maybe allocate that money towards something that's actually producing better results. And we've seen that with some of the most successful entrepreneurs. And so I'm curious if you look at that and you think about those times, Thomas. How did you determine that? How did you identify? How did you make that tough decision and say, okay, you know what? Let's go ahead and cut that off. Even though we went down halfway down that road, we got to cut it off and we got to come back and go this other way. You know, Christian, this is uh, actually a really important topic. And when, when you look at kind of the literature and the mentoring that, that I give, that I received, um, the, the, the trainings in business school or, or uh, School of Hard Knocks, we focus mostly on the starting of the company um, and or the starting of a project and less the ending of it, which is the you know your your point and and we do that in a lot of different ways it's it's um, it's exiting so hiring people um, is really important, but isn't firing just as important. You know, starting an idea is important. Um, if you didn't have it, it wouldn't be there. But pruning um, um, is is what what I call it. Not all not all ideas are good, and so um, I think that there part of the way to do it is a culture, because by by this time you have other people involved. 
And it's having a culture which is willing to accept mistakes and looks instead at, did the person have a great idea? Did they work? Maybe it didn't work, but did they do everything you know, that they could? And we still, so we still value that person. Um, it's interesting. I'd like to tell you just a quick story about pivoting, which is so important. That's really when you've, you know, you've made a mistake, you've understood it, and you've come up with, with, a, with a change, and it's happened in every company. When we were starting Thrive, we, one of our earliest investors was the largest angel group in the world, actually, Life Science Angels in California, in Menlo Park. Uh, absolutely an, an incredible powerhouse. And we were presenting, we got through the due diligence process and we were presenting uh, to a group of dinner, at dinner over 200 people. And we actually spoke about how we had started with with one product, which was a very ambitious product, kind of full walk-away automation of cell culture, which does need change. And we had pivoted based on an early collaborator saying, yeah, we like what you're doing, but you know, we really need this. Well, I gave that exact, uh, and we ended up getting funded by, by Life Science Angels, and they really appreciated what we were doing. A week later, I gave that same presentation in Boston to one of the leading Boston angel groups, and it got a completely different reaction. Somebody stood up afterwards and said, you messed up, and I would never invest in you. And I said, what, what's your question? He didn't really have one. His point was that, as he said, I want to invest in management teams that know what their product is, know what is needed, and don't make mistakes. To me, pivoting is just another word for mistakes. That's, that's a culture that is found more often in New England and much less in California. And um, not everything that California does is great, but uh, that kind of openness is really great. Um, the willingness to not necessarily look at it as a mistake, but okay, we were developing a good product. The Broad Institute and Harvard Stem Cell Institute, both prestigious institutions, um, had actually collaborated with us in developing this full walk away automation of cell culture. But they said, we would really like your imaging and analytics, and we want that soon, and we think that's the best thing that you're doing. And so, you know, so we, we pivoted. And I don't believe that we could have known that without having some of those interactions. And having a culture of not accepting a pivot and looking as a mistake um, is really going to hurt the company. So having that culture of we're going to listen to our customers, um, we are going to make mistakes, um, and we'll come up with you know we'll come up with with solutions. And actually, some of the best ideas, and I think any entrepreneur would say this who's had experience in in a few companies. Some of the best ideas come out of mistakes. That, that you've made. The product that we ended up with is really a killer product and far better than what we started with. Um, is there a need for that first product? You know, absolutely, and maybe in the future. But this is this is a better product, and it came you know it came out of listening. Sometimes it comes out of a crisis. So at Cytic, we automated Pap smears, which had been done the same way for for 65 years, and we were bringing machine vision, or AI, to, to life sciences. Pap smears are the most widely given primary screening test in the world. And before Cytic, it was done the exact same way, manually, without data, very um, inaccurately. And so we were going to bring machine vision and read these slides that had cells on them and were looking for cancerous cells. We were going to do that automatically with machine vision. The system didn't work. Uh, as is typical of early stage companies, we did not have a lot of runway. Venture capitalists don't, don't give you a lot of runway. So you're lucky if you have a year and you know, after you've spent it a few months. 
and uh, we were in the position that our product didn't work. So we had to develop another product first, not ideal, that, you know, um, that we had to do this. So we had to change the way pap smears are prepared. So rather than a pap smear being smeared on a slide and you have cells on top of cells, which makes it hard for computers to read, but also people, we came up with a new preparation, single layer of cells, and that completely changed the course of cervical cancer. And it sold like hotcakes. And it was out of a crisis that we came up with that. And what was good for computers was good for people. Um, so it had an immediate need while we were developing our automated machine vision system, which ended up being incredibly successful as well. As Cytic was bought for $6 billion uh, by Hologic. And 90% of pap smears in this country now use those instruments. So out of crisis um, can come some of the, you know, the best ideas. Having too much money is often bad because you don't have to listen carefully. You can just stay bunkered and, and keep building what you think the world needs and not have to show it to people. Um, so, you know, pivoting is key and it is incredibly difficult to figure out, okay, I've really made a mistake. It takes a little bit of humbleness. Um, combined with ego that you're still right, you just missed it a little bit. Oh man, those are some really great examples. And what I find so interesting, you mentioned this offline, the importance of customer feedback and future customers and having that conversation and then obviously integrating that into the pivot of the culture uh, as well as the company itself. And you know that's how you're able to make those and, and, and ride the wave of that. With that being said, because customers and listening to customers, current customers, maybe past customers, maybe future customers, whatever it is, Thomas, how do you, what questions are you asking to get the right data? So then you, with that data, you can make the right decision naturally and evolve your product and, and uh, your position in the market. Um, so generally, we don't know what the right questions are even to ask, which is, you know, which is part of the problem. So we have to listen really carefully. And um, it, you know, I keep coming back to the importance of personality in, in entrepreneurship. We had, I remember, um, we were building our, we were making that pivot I was talking about at Thrive from this full robotic walkaway automation to focusing on really a next generation microscope that was capturing, you know, all this, all this data. And we had an industry expert um, as an advisory board. Real advisory boards are important, not Hollywood ones where you just recruit a big name to help you raise money. Um, big names maybe are not you know, necessarily going to give you all the time um, that you need. Um, a real advisory board is helpful. And we had in uh, this expert, he had been chief scientific officer of a major instrument company. Um, he was a customer um, as well uh, for, for us. And we asked them to be on our advisory board and something we call the product development advisory panel and asked him to come in and critique and, uh, the product. And I'll never forget, we're sitting in the conference room. We had all the employees because there were like eight of us um, to hear his feedback. And he started lambasting us with all the things that we we're doing wrong. And I'm thinking to myself, I need to pull a fire alarm or something and end, end this meeting because it's going to really demoralize, you know, the employees. It's going to demoralize me. And and then I, I I dug in deep and realized that this was gold. This wasn't gold. This was platinum. To have somebody giving us that feedback, taking the time, you know, and honestly, and I I ended up smiling through the meeting. The the more he criticized what we were doing. And he left, and, and my customers, uh, excuse me, my, my employees said, Tom, aren't you devastated? I mean, you, you're smiling, but this, is, this was really, really awful. And I said, no, it wasn't. This, this was absolutely incredible. He wouldn't have been doing us a service if he didn't tell us everything that was wrong with our product, and we let him 
speak and we didn't you know, act offensive or, or anything like that. That was one of the happiest moments. And I really am thankful um, for people who take the time um, to give you the feedback. And actually, most people will. Um, potential customers actually care a lot. If they see that you're developing something that the world needs, that they need, so many people will help you. You just you have to reach out. Almost any customer, any CEO, anybody in the world almost will take your call within the industry. Uh, people just don't reach out and they're not receptive enough. So from that, you can begin to figure out the right questions, but it's having that, you know, really listening, which we all know is an important skill. Well, you mentioned something really valuable, and I'm going to reiterate, you know, one, it's the humility, but also, it, you know, you, you have to remove your ego from that, that situation and that pride and be able to say, well, humbly, I'm going to take that. But also what I found interesting is the way you were able to – that's a mindset thing where someone's hearing the same words, but you yeah. choose to hear something of value. And just like the circumstance of tough situation happened or whatever that situation is, and you learn from it instead of sitting there and saying, you know what, why me and all those you know negative thoughts. So I just think that's really interesting that that's, that was also part of your DNA that helped you obviously pivot very quickly. I want to ask you this, um, Tom, we talk a little bit of much uh, – Offline, we talked about the importance of building out an A, a player team, right? And as you, you evolve from you know, inception to now you're running an eight-figure business, now you're running to a mid-eight-figure business, to a nine-figure business, to a billion-dollar valuated company, et cetera, there's a lot of different stages. And I'm curious, Thomas, do you look at hiring at different levels and different stages? So, hey, when you're at you know, sub-eight figures – uh, you know, top line revenue, you look at for these kind of caliber individuals, or do you tend to go for the A players? Because I do know at each level of the business, you have to get different kind of quality people that are familiar with uh, a company, the ins and outs, whether it's a C-suite, whether it's mid-management, whether that's whatever. So I'm curious, when you're, when you're looking at evolving that the team, how does that evolve as the business grows? Also um, really worth, um, worth thinking about. So it, it, it does change in in many ways, but there's also a core that, that, that doesn't. So what changes is the type of personality that might fit in with a early stage company is different than, than what you need to maybe scale the company. And so I'm, I'm good at maybe figuring out how to take gross margins from, you know, 20% to 80% or 20% to 60%. Really, like, relook at the whole thing and change it. But then you need people who take it from the 60% to the 61% to the 62%. So it really, it, it definitely changes across time. Um, one of the problems that companies run into is not realizing that and not changing the individuals involved. As you evolve... You, a lot of the positions that you have require different personalities. People who, and it's hard because you know of this person as they did a great job, they're great, they're fantastic, but what you realize is a few times where you then place that person in a, a, another position and they fail and you're trying to figure out what, what's wrong with, you know, with this situation, you know, what's wrong with that person, um, but it's, you know, it's a mismatch. It's a mismatch. However, there, there is, you know, hiring is incredibly difficult to do, but I do think that, you know, as you say, you call it a player, not, not, um, not everybody that we hire needs to be an A player. We don't necessarily need all, you know, all um, managers, you know, we need, um, we need doers, but there is a kind of a DNA, which is a completely wrong use of the word, um, but but colloquially it's used. There, there, is, there are personality aspects that, that great employees have, um, and those, those are personality, and I would tend to take somebody who's got you know, that ability to learn, to be coached, to make judgment, to put themselves in another person's shoes, um, you know, to, to listen, a lot of the things we've talked about, and teach them what they need. 
Now, if there are certain positions, highly regulated medical, where you know you just can't do that, but um, even there, among choosing among the people who are qualified, um, it's it's so much about personality, which which is hard to gauge when you're hiring. So, with that being said, I've I've talked to some people about culture and the importance of it, and I've also talked about you know I'm so glad you, you mentioned that how the you know. An A player in, in a sub eight figure business may not be an A player. It might be a B plus, B minus in a you know mid eight nine figure you know top line business, right? So it's it's all really contextual depending upon what stage you're at. So I appreciate the evolution of that, and you do have to evolve to it. And like you mentioned, that that the margins of 60, 61, 62, that's very intricate. My question really is the importance of skill versus, hey, do they fit that culture as well? The importance. I've had some where they emphasize the culture. Is this person a fit of culture? We can always give them more of the skill and establish the skill depending upon what that what that job requires. Or do you require a little bit more of skill and then say, hey, you know, culture as well. Which one do you emphasize more when you're doing the hiring process? Um, I would imagine you're probably very involved with your C-suite um, you know, and maybe even mid-management, not entirely sure how, how involved you are in that process. But um, I'd love to explain a little bit what you're looking at, what you're emphasize when you're walking through and looking at those, those individuals. So as the company gets bigger, you have more freedom, actually, to, to pick people who have the culture, and I would include in culture kind of personality, traits because that that is kind of part of um, part of the culture um, when you're starting a company you actually you're walking a tightrope and you have to have people with skill and culture there's no time for on-the-job training and um, I hate to say it you know it's it's so tempting to hire someone and know that you can teach them but at the earliest stage you can't um, no on-the-job training. I often, you know, after interviews, I'll say, great person. If we had five people in our uh, manufacturing team or our sales people, this is somebody I would love to hire because they've got you know, just the right, the right way of doing things, but you can't. So one of the really advantages of as you scale is the fact that you can add people who have the culture and you'll teach them the skills. And, and I think it's harder to find those. Um, I mean, obviously the hardest is those who have both, but um, it, having the right personality, being you know, able to fit into a culture, um, it's fantastic when you get to be a big enough group. Um, and, you know, we're not talking about um, a company that's over um, 100. I mean, if you're under 100 employees, you can add um, a lot of diversity in the way skills and and um, and the way people think. As long as they have the right, you know, the right culture, you also have the luxury as you add people that you can add slightly different skill sets. So in our case, we're at Thrive. We're very cross-functional. We're bringing together mechanical engineering, um, electrical engineering, AI, databases, imaging. And so in selling our product, I'd love to be able to have a software salesperson because we have a high content of, self, of software. But we really, we're selling instruments with a high content of software, so we really need instrument um, experience. Um, I can't wait till we have five salespeople instead of three and we just hired our third. I'm imagining that fifth person is going to be, uh, well, actually, we're looking at a candidate who doesn't have the skills but has just the right stuff. Um, so that may be our fourth. And um, for the fifth, um, I hope we can hire somebody who's not the, the well-trained instrument, but brings to it maybe the software side. So it's very contextual, it sounds like. It's like an art and a science a little bit. It's yeah. obviously saying, hey, okay, hey, in this stage, at this situation, and with this kind of job requirement, this is what we're looking for in regards to the candidate. That's the reason why it's, it's, it is kind of a quantity game. Okay, gotcha. And, 
And to just uh, um, tie it back to pivoting, one of the mistakes that I've seen, because not all the companies I've been in um, have pivoted as easily um, as they could, one of the mistakes that's made is um, if you're, say, changing from being a machine vision AI company to an actual life science FDA regulated company, uh, you need to change people and bring in new skills. And sometimes companies, they get the pivot right, but the people that they had, unfortunately, um, either aren't the right ones or they need to make sure they bring in you know, new ones. If you're now not just doing the machine vision piece, but you're actually involved in preparation of pap smears and it's regulated, you need to bring in regulatory people and manufacturing people and, and some new culture too. Well, see, that's why I find it so interesting. I've, I've had numerous individuals I've talked to offline where they say, you know, you get that kind of startup feel. And sometimes you can get that startup feel for until you're running about nine figure uh, run rate. But then all of a sudden you have to get the, the, the suit and ties, right? Those individuals that have the MBA degrees and stuff like that, that kind of be able to actually – yeah, regulatory. build systems and processes and make sure that it's actually running and stabilizing your business. Right. So, and that's why I'm curious, Thomas, you know, with the CEO position, naturally there's an evolution even as yourself, right, as a CEO. And naturally you're wearing a thousand hats, but over a period of time, you're taking one hat and giving it to another person, right? And those those hats are really job you know, requirements. You have a COO, you have a CMO, you have a C, uh, you know, chief investment officer, if that's, if that's the case, or a financial officer, whoever it is, right? All these individuals, and you slowly take those hats off, and then you become and you start pivoting toward the vision and the, really the bigger picture four, five, seven years down the road. My question, though, Thomas – is what does that look like normally? Is that um, at what stage do you really start pivoting? Is I would imagine it's a very slow progression and evolution throughout the life of the company. But uh, for those that are listening that want to have a, a billion dollar value, a lot of our audience are mid eight figure, you know, low eight figure uh, top line business owners, and so they're looking to scale to that next level. But they're also wearing a ton of hats, and there needs to be a, an evolution for themselves. So how do you handle that, and what do you look at? as prioritize to ensure that you get to that CEO where you only want to wear in one hat and you're, you're focusing on the vision of the company itself. So I would question whether any one of us is the right person forever in a company. So everything I just said about bringing in, you know, new skills, you know, when, when you pivot or when you grow, it does also apply to the CEO. And I'm very proud of the fact that seven companies have become multi-billion dollar exits for investors, have you know, built major, major products. None of them would be there <clears throat> if it were not for me. None of them would be there if I stayed involved and didn't hand it over to others. And um, now that doesn't mean you have to necessarily leave the company. Um, but you have to really change, you know, change your role. And I think a lot of the reason for companies not moving to whatever next level of diversification or of revenues, um, we also we often have to look at ourselves. And you know, have we let go? Um, are we trying to make this a lifestyle company? You know, have we brought in advisors and and, and board members who? Are going to help us scale. Who are at the next level, even though it may mean, you know, that that we're going to exit. However, there are things that founders can often do that are incredibly important. A lot of companies um, lose when a founder leaves, or maybe you know is marginalized. They lose some of that culture, that passion, um, and be, and forget why they started. Um, and so um, there needs to be kind of creative destruction within a company. Somebody uh, may not be the founder, but somebody has to play the role. But so often it's the founder of, okay, um, these products are great, but we're not spending enough time thinking about what the next thing will be, what the next innovation will be. And I see a lot of competition kind of, you know, following us uh, it's very easy for an organization to get very focused on doing what it does. And so 
I would say that the role of a founder needs to change over time, and sometimes we're the culprit. If if you know if we don't move ourselves into the right area and bring in um, bring in the right people. How do you identify that? Is that just intuition? You get that understanding, like okay, hey, I've I've tapped out to this position, CEO, and I got to you know move into more of that larger fixture of it, or is that you know maybe mentors or maybe some of your C-suite? You have that really difficult conversation because we have seen where you know you got Bill Gates, you've got Steve yeah. Jobs, you got these individuals that have pulled off, and and, and you also got Google and Alphabet company, and you know Larry and and and, and Sugar. My point is, is how do you identify that? Is that intuition, or is that some sort of like strategic way of thinking? So certainly, uh, self, you know, um, analysis, reflection is important. I would say you know most of us are really bad at that, and so you know getting help. Um, is is important and that help comes from a great board you know great advisors um co-founders um who you have a really you know incredible relationship with and you can talk about you know talk about these kinds these kinds of things um again it also comes back to that personality of the smartest people i know don't act the smartest and are looking for feedback and you know look upon everyone as a way they can learn one of the best entrepreneurs widely recognized he was a co-founder in in one of my companies and he went on and and started um, a company that that failed and i know some co-founders i who started a company, it failed, and they never recovered. They never started another company again. They um, you know, just either seethed with resentment or you know, lost confidence. And this guy, who is a, a mentor um, to me, um, as well as a co-founder, um, he had a, a you know, difficult, bad situation happen. And I, may, you know, I was just so impressed. About six months after... Um, he it was, was exited and somebody else um, got involved and ended up being very successful. He went to me and he said a list of about 50 people and asked, what could I have done better? I, I never had that happen in my life. I've never had it happen before or since that somebody would be that reflective and willing, you know, to listen. And he went on and started, his next company was phenomenal, was another you know, billion dollar exit. Um, so everything I'm saying about personality for, you know, what we want for employees and people that will listen, et cetera, we got to apply that to ourselves and um, reaching out and being open to criticism, you know, is important. We're probably... You know, the most blind when it comes to ourselves. There are people who are just, you know, fantastic at that, uh, but I think we can all use help. I really uh, believe strongly in coaches. Um, you know, when, uh, when companies are able to allocate some resources to that. Um, again, that's... And if somebody reacts negatively to that, one of my questions when interviewing people is, have you ever used a coach? Would you ever use a coach? Um, if we made one available, what would, you, what would you do? And and some say, oh, I you know I think the whole thing's ridiculous, and you know it's it's uh, you know too too much money is wasted on that. Um, that's probably not the right right person for my company. Right off the bat, that's a, a red flag. You're like, all right, well, that's probably not the, good to be a fit. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And I do see the value of it. And this is what I'm always intrigued. I'm, I'm a big believer in mentors. I'm a big believer in having the right board. And I'm a big believer in, you know, obviously, um, iron sharpens iron, right? There has to be a little bit of conflict, a little bit of fire in order for us to all to grow. But my question for you, Thomas, are who are those individuals that played a role in that? And how did you optimize those relationships, right? To be able to humble yourself, to ask the right questions, to say, hey, what else could I do better? How can I, you know, improve, et cetera, et cetera. What, who are those individuals that played that role uh, personally, you know, business, whatever it is, and then as well as how did you optimize those relationships to the fullest? So, um, you know, what, 
what the story I just gave about one of my mentors that that had a lot of effect on me that that he well-known guy successful had a failure and was willing you know was willing to listen and and that had a huge um, a huge impact on me uh, I think that I mentioned earlier advisory boards um, that can be incredibly helpful and not as well used by by companies as it as it really can be a lot of people shy away from them because gee they cost a lot of money um, our advisory board does it all for stock and probably will for several years and it has not prevented us from getting some of the top industry um, people on it um, obviously surrounding yourself with people that are going to give you advice they know that you want the advice and you listen is going to make it successful I mean if, if you start acting defensive um, which you know s sometimes some of us will and and um, maybe somebody will slap us you know down but you do have to you have to be willing to think about the way I think about it is where am I stuck where may I might I be stuck and so often when you're stuck and you're spending a lot of time in that rut I think to myself there are people who've been through this there's got to be somebody who has the answer to this who who can help me and almost all the time I've been able to find somebody who has been in that situation it you know may take some seeking and networking and asking you know and asking people so you know surrounding yourself with people and and I think it's important they're not employees uh, because that that does create a dynamic um, not all talent that I view as the team is actually employees the your your vendors can be incredible sources of advice um, obviously you know your advisory board your customers um, so you know surrounding yourself with people putting yourself in a situation where you're you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to get feedback and um, and and listen well it's, it's interesting because like you mentioned and what you're kind of alluding to is that you have to have discernment on who you're going to listen to and who that feedback loop is and who those relationships mm -hmm. are because you could you know and, and like you mentioned not employees because obviously that just strains the relationship but obviously other board members that are there or have been or produced or created um, and I know you're on on a lot of boards uh, be able to give that uh, feedback for those that are you know more um, younger you know. in their business journey which is awesome uh for those that want to reach out thomas i really appreciate you being on here and just opening up being authentic and showing up and but also giving incredible amount of wisdom and insight about how to really scale you know several uh unicorns which is incredible uh, under your belt which is really awesome and have numerous successful exits as well uh for those that want to reach out maybe follow your journey maybe learn a little bit more about what you know thrive bioscience is doing i know you guys are doing some really uh, exciting stuff going on there uh, how do they reach out how do they do, uh, be part of what you got going on Thomas well thanks thanks for asking um, my email address is Tom T-O-M at thrivebio.com but on our website um, I have my email address one of the things I've learned in life is that sometimes good things come from unexpected or strange places and yeah you might you know get a lot of um, uh, recruiters or you know people who are selling things but um, I think part of my job is to get out and tell my story and also let people communicate with me. So if you go to thrivebio.com, which is um, Thrive Bioscience, and you go to the team, you, know, you, can, you can click on my, my email address if you didn't remember, uh, tom at thrivebio.com. And we're looking for investors, for customers, for employees, for advisors, um, you know, all all of those. Awesome, things. guys. And those links will be in the description. I'll put his website, his LinkedIn, as well as his email. Uh, Tom, I really appreciate you making yourself so available to putting your email there. So I'll put his email down there so you can reach out to him, connect with him. He's very available. He's very uh, responsive with his email as well. Uh, Thomas, I really appreciate you being on here. Again, just incredible knowledge. And I always love to 
you know, you've gone through numerous exits. You've you've shared a lot today. And if you, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about that young Thomas. Okay, if you imagine that young Thomas, it's just starting out, a little naive, has no idea, doesn't have the experience that in the skills. But what insecurities did you have to overcome to become the successful Thomas Forrest Far Porch you are today? I gotta say, I, <clears throat> I've learned from our session, um, from the questions you've asked, and and the way it kind of forces me um, to think. So, uh, I am interested in so many things, and oftentimes that is an incredible advantage. So, a lot of the solutions that are really powerful come from people who cross fields. And there's that cross pollination, and so, you know, I like to solve big problems um, that will change the world. Rarely are they going to be solved by just the approaches that have been taken, or you know, just from the field. Um, the advantage I have is um, just you know this really broad interest. I've been in so many different kinds of companies and so many different kinds of fields, but focus is difficult. Um, at the same time, you have to stay very focused on, you know, one company. Um, yes, there's value in, you know, learning what's out there, but um, it's not easy to, from, you know, young Thomas, um, you know, to, to focus. Um, and I get better and better at it. Thrive is um, <clears throat> the, the longest that I have um, – been involved as an employee. Um, other companies hasn't been as long, and then I, you know, will stay on the board or, um, or something like that. But I've got you know a little bit better um, and better. Young Thomas wasn't nearly as humble as um, as I am. I, I'm pretty embarrassed by um, what I was. Um, in, you know, in many respects, maybe, you know, lack of humbleness, lack of knowing what I didn't know. Um, I think not everybody can learn. I, um, I was lucky that I was able to, you know, improve myself. Um, one, one of the things I look for in hiring people, um, in friends, um, is people who want to improve themselves. If they're if they're not interested in that, and there's a certain type of person, it may mean, you know, I read self-help books. Um, and I, I, you know, none of us are created perfectly by any means. We're all perfectly imperfect. Um, but, you know, some people are really open, um, you know, to, to learning. Um, and I'm really glad I'm, I've changed. Um, That's awesome, man. That's so, Difficult question uh, to even think about, but uh, I'm going to give it some more thought after. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. You know, so humility, and that has been an evolution itself, but also knowing what you don't know and, and finding the right path. Uh, Thomas, I just really appreciate you being on here and just sharing incredible wisdom. Guys, that is the CEO and president and board member of Thrive Biosyn Bioscience, the one and only Thomas Forrest Farb Horch. Guys, that is Journey with Christian Abbas podcast. Until next time, be uncommon if you can.